Alright guys, this is a long plane review for Double Dragon 3, the Rosetta Stone, on the Amstrad CPC, released by Storm Software under license from Trade West in 1991. And yes, this is an arcade conversion. The coin-op itself was released in 1990, a year earlier, by Technos Japan. And in keeping with this being part three, it now allowed up to three players. The third player being a new character called Sonny in a yellow top. In fact, there's actually lots of new characters which make up your extra lives that you will play as when you die. And there's the arcade cab in all its glory. So before we do the Amstrad CPC long play, we're going to quickly play the arcade version so we can talk about that and then compare to the Amstrad version. So here we go, this has been played in MAME. And this is the attract sequence. Billy and Jimmy went on a journey to complete their martial arts. On their return home, they were visited by some mysterious stranger. I missed that text there. Hiroku, find the three Rosetta Stones, then go to Egypt. There you will find the world's strongest enemy, but beware, no one has come back alive. Ooh. Ominous music as well. Double Dragon 3, the Rosetta and some sampled speech there. <laughs> Actually, there's one of the new extra characters at the top there in the uh, orange trousers. Big guy called Sonny. And uh, let's kick this off then. Mission one, America. Ah. Now the first thing we're going to do is go into the weapon what shop. Now this caused quite a bit of controversy at the time because you have to spend real money and credits to purchase items here. I mean, is this the first example of microtransactions in a game? <laughs> there was such negative feedback that this was removed entirely from the Japan release, which came out after the US Europe release. But anyway, this is where you can buy weapons on later stages, extra energy, a power up, i.e. your kicks and punches are more deadly, tricks, so you can do a spinning kick and extra guys that we mentioned earlier. But we just saw the spinning kick in action there a second ago. But we're not off to a good start really with that. It's not endearing itself to the public. And a lot of people didn't like that. Uh, the fighting system has also been changed from the previous game which had directional attack buttons, i.e. a button to attack left and a button to attack right. Now we just have a punch, kick and jump button which works in the direction you're facing. But we can now run and do a headbutt move whilst running. There's also a grab move to uh, throw opponents, we'll see shortly. And if more than one player, you can combine your attacks together. Note the jump off the wall there. And also the trick allows you to do the spinning uh, kick we saw earlier. And you can now also jump on downed enemies. Um, but when I was playing this, I've actually broken and glitched the game. You're supposed, to be going for, you're supposed to be able to go through that door, but you can't. So I thought I'd try and go back to the um, weapon shop, go in and come out again, see if it resets it. But like, this is the first time I've played an arcade game where I've actually glitched it. I think it was because I did that um, uh, 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 neck throw move while that guy was in the doorway and threw him off the screen. So it still regis registers him as being alive, but he's not. Scrolling there is not very smooth, a little bit juddery. Um, but, and this isn't really playing smoothly. So I don't know if this is because of emulation, but the sprite movement is jumping all over the place. In fact, I'll show you that in a second. Scrolling is a bit juddery. Just going to fast forward here. If the actual coin up is like this, then that's shocking for 1990. Look at the sprite movement here as I just wiggle the joystick around. This is how the player moves around the screen. That's awful. Um, this wasn't developed in-house at Technos, and it shows. Instead, it was contracted out to some company called East Technology. We're going to run down the clock here. And I don't think they've done a great job here. The game balance is all over the place. And I've got as far as the final mission and just gave up in frustration at the difficulty. I know coin-ups are designed to munch your coins, but this is ridiculous. And there's one of the new characters. So if you die and you've got extra lives, extra guys, you then get to play as one of them called Roni. And there's more later on. But there you go, guys. That's the arcade version. It's crap. <laughs> Here's the box art for the Amstrad version. And let's get the Amstrad one started off. 
and running. Oh, right, okay. Um, actually quite a nice loading screen here. Not bad at all. Um, we will talk more on the coders and stuff and the plot in a little bit. Um, you can see the, the uh, credits there for all the licensing crap. And we're just gonna do our controls very quickly. And then we'll kick this off. Um, I loved Double Dragon 1 and 2 on the Amstrad, at least the Richard Applin 128K versions. And I was very excited to get Double Dragon 3 when I saw it for sale. Um, I also, my, my copy actually came with Rodland bundled in. Um, rather cheaply, actually. Anyway, here we go. And we're off. We're going to go straight into the weapon shop. And we're going to use all our coins here. Just use them up. Buy all the extra guys as, as much as you can. Um, definitely need the extra guys by the tricks, the energy, and the power up, and exit out there. Don't worry, guys. You get you will have enough coins. To spend them in the shop as long as you uh, don't uh, die and lose a cont uh, need to use a continue. And there we go. Off we go, guys. Um, and you, you can see it's a specky port. Um, and only a few colours. More on the colouring in a little bit. And it is slow as all hell. It is absolutely chugging. There's even a delay there and that sprite uh, flying when he got kicked. Scrolling's juddery and slow as well. It moves at an absolute snail's pace. Um, but yeah, guys, this is 100% this is confirmed to be a specky port. Um, we'll talk more on that in a little bit. Um, I will say, actually, the sprites are really nice looking, actually really nicely well defined and that's because it's we're in mode one the high uh, the higher resolution mode that normally is only four colors actually go guys you can see actually there's more than four colors on the screen uh due to um sort of a ras raster effects that the uh, programmer has done here um so got to use the raster splitting the screen so it exceeds the four colors by default. The main game windows you can see there has a black, light blue, yellow and orange and actually the yellow and orange and black work really well. I don't know why pro um, graphics artists did use that more on their sprites on Mode 1 Amstrad games. Um, and at the top we have red, dark blue and white to add a bit more extra colour to the game. And you'll see that like, the background graphics are sort of in, obviously in basically one or two colours a colour and black and that colour will change for different levels just to keep things interesting. Um, but yeah, it's moving at an absolute snail's pace. The combat is pretty poor um, in terms of like you're really just using the kick over and over again. You don't really want to use the jump kick. Um, I find I have more success with the kick than the punch. Uh, but because I bought the power up, oh no, we've got more enemies before we can exit. It's not glitched like the arcade version we were playing. Um, I think the kick has slightly more range, or I don't know if that's a kind of placebo thing. I don't know. But because we bought the power up, we down enemies in one kick or one punch, and they go flying across the screen. And that's important because we kind of want to kick and get the enemies flying all the way to the right of the plane area, as far right as we can go. A problem here, guys, in this game, in terms of difficulty, is not really the people you're fighting, but the time limit. The time limit on this is ridiculous. The clock ticks down way too fast, or, or and or you're not given enough time, and we'll talk more on that in a little bit. But as you can see, as we get to the end of this level here, as more enemies spawn, we're just getting below 100 seconds. And when we finish this level, we will be very, very close to losing time here. And I haven't made a single mistake here. I don't think I've been hit once by any of these guys. So the, the challenge in this game is to actually just beat the clock. Oops, I didn't mean to jump there. I think I wanted to show off my spinning kick move, which is really hard to pull off. And I'll talk more on the awful controls later as well. Look, 60 seconds left there. That's ticking down really quickly. I think if I'd been knocked down once there, I'd be probably hitting zero. 
on that. And this is the first level. Blimey. Okay, uh, so this is the second part of basically mission one. Uh, we're going to have some motorcycle guys here to do flying kicks and knock them off. And it's really hard to pull off a flying kick. So actually, let's talk about the controls. Um, actually, it's a good point too. Uh, these are not correctly described in the game manual, specifically the jump attack controls. Now, to do a flying kick to the right, for example, the manual tells you to jump and right. If the jump and right, if the button is pushed and let go, or jump kick if button is held down. So, so basically, what it's telling you is do a jump kick, to, uh, flying jump kick to the right. Hold down the fire button with up and right and keep it held down. If you do that, nothing happens, but you just jump. Um, instead, rather awkwardly, you have to do fire up and right, let go, then push right and fire again. And same thing with the tricks and the spinning kick. Uh, where instead you have to push, instead of having to push up and fire, you have to do push up and fire, let go, then up and fire again. And that's nasty. So not only is the manual wrong, but that's really awkward con awkward controls. Uh, see the graffiti in the back wall there? Tom is a git. Tom uh, is the name of the programmer, and we'll talk more on the people behind the game in a little bit again. Um, what we're going to do here is see if we can get all the enemies knocked down the conveyor belt. Remember, there's a hole in the middle of the conveyor belt to the left there. We've actually got plenty of time on this level to, to muck about. <laughs> as long as you hit him and they don't hit you. Whee! And splat. And here's the end of level boss. The Texaco Leatherman. In fact, he's related to the end boss in, I think, the previous two Double Dragon games. I think it's like his younger brother that's taken over the uh, gang. And again, we'll, we've will we got plenty of time to talk about the plot and stuff and the characters in, in this video. I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, here comes the old lady. The first stone is in China. Your mission is waiting for you, Double Dragon, she says. Why are you trusting this old little old lady? I do not know. And you'll find out you would be unwise. You were unwise to anyway. So here's mission two: China, level three, essentially. And there's another weapon shop. Now um, there isn't buy the energy, but don't buy the weapon. Uh, the weapon you get is like some nunchuckers, and they're they're slightly slower to use due to I think the extra animation it takes. Um, I think there's like maybe two or three frames of animation on the nunchuckers compared to one for like the kick or the punch. So don't bob with it. And the to me, it seems that the range isn't as good as the um, kick. So avoid buying the weapons, essentially. Uh, I find them useless. So now we have an even tighter to time limit on this level. So what I'm gonna what I'm trying to do is bunch the enemies together. Look, I'm moving left there, and kicking them to the right if I can. <coughs> so they're so they're flying over to the right, and I can keep moving right and pushing right to get to the end of the level. So I'm going to let that guy in the bottom left just keep walking towards me and just dispatch that other guy. And I may well just keep walking and walking to the end of the level before actually going after him. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Just trying to remember what I did on the, this long play. Because I did it uh, a week or two ago. And God damn it, we've got another guy that spawned from the left. We really want them spawning from the right, so we just bunch them together and keep them flying off to the right because of that damn time limit. There we go, reach the end here. Look, we can do the jump kick off the wall. Whee! So that's uh, in this version. At least some of the special moves are, like the spinning kick and the jump kick off the wall. The uh, neck grab throw move is missing. Although that is present in the Commodore 64 version. And good, we've all got them grouped up to the right here. So the usual way of just beating them is to like move up and down and move like vertically into their horizontal path. So you're lined up horizontally and just be quick with your kicks. But there is a horrible lag and delay sometimes if your kicks and punches. And god damn it, they've spawned from the left, which I suppose they're not going to spawn through the wall, of course. 
really want to try and just, oh god then there's another one I can just move so slowly that's the problem good we've got those two bunched up uh, sound effects are really poor literally like I think there's like, literally like two sound effects a hit move and the move for when they land on the floor good they're all bunched up there and just time it right when they get up to do your kick and do it before they can do anything. There's actually a timing to this. And we're going to use this on... Oh, God. There's like literally one more guy. We're going to, use a, we're going to time it uh, for when an enemy is downed, count, and then do your attack at the right moment. So it's usually about three you need to count to. So one, two, three, kick. So I count to about three from when they actually land on the floor and stop moving, then count to three and then kick. Here's the boss. You have to kill me before you touch the stone. Ugh. And again, he's pretty easy to move like vertically into him and just be first to kick and punch and then time it by counting to three. So one, two, three, kick. And just rinse and repeat. But look at the clock, guys. It is ticking down. Hmm. Trouble is, we can't just do enough damage on him. Uh, we have to, like, we can't just get, like, a, maybe a few kicks and punches, get a combo before he's knocked to the floor. We, we, we kick him and knock him down once, and then we have to wait for him to get back up again. So we can't drain his energy. Uh, we have this wait to look 30 now. In fact, uh, that's not t uh, counted down in seconds. I'm sure that's faster than seconds there. We, I think we've just done it. We did it with 14 seconds to spare. After finding the first stone, the hero went to find the second. 14 seconds to spare there. I had to do that level absolutely perfectly. I think we got hit once. I mean, didn't manage to get knocked down by it. Um, so that's good. <laughs> um, otherwise, if I'd been knocked down, uh, that level would have been a complete fail. Now, there's a weapon shot there to the left in this uh, Japan mission. I think technically about level four now. Um, but don't go in there. All you can buy there is extra energy and a weapon. And I find you can buy a sword like these uh, uh, guys have. But um, I find it a bit useless. You've already got a powerful kick that knocks them down in one. The sword doesn't do any additional damage. Perhaps just puts you off because it looks like it has a shorter range where it might not have. Um, and we can make do without the extra energy. Because uh, again, guys, we essentially this level, especially this level, has to be done perfectly. And, I, and I, 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 I think I still didn't manage to do this in time before time ran out. And there we go. Um, so, what shall we talk about? Uh, lots to talk about. Um, all right, let's talk about the coders first of all. I usually do that towards the start of the vid. Um, the coders of this game was uh, Tom Prosser. He was the coder. He, he also did Dragon Breed, Joe Blade Free, and Spooked on the Amstrad. Um, but he did the Specky version, and I, I'm pretty sure he handled the conversion and port to the Amstrad. It's all his code here. Um, so there we go. Graphics are by Sean G. McClure. Um, he's done quite a few games, actually, graphics-wise. Uh, gra he's done graphics for Count Duckula 1, Gilbert, Hero Herobotics, Kickoff 2, NARC, Official uh, Father Christmas game. Postman Pat 2, Rally Cross Challenge, Rodlands, Saint Dragon, Sooty and Sweep, Super Seymour, Super Ted, The Real Stunt Experts, and Time Machine. So it's kind of a mixed bag uh, of work there, ranging from the really bad, like Narc, Narc are terrible graphics, but I don't know if he's entirely responsible for the sprites in that, uh, to the really good graphics like Rodland. Although Rodland mentioned there is interesting because, as I mentioned earlier, when I bought Double Dragon Free, it came uh, packaged with Rodland as a double package, at no extra charge, and, well, both games suffered from being terribly slow. 
And here we are. <sighs> um, Sean uh, was um, interviewed in Retro Gamer magazine, issue 189, not too long ago, in a making of article of the game on the Specky of which this is a direct port of, of course, guys. And aside from the usual stories of uh, they had little time to make the game and it was tough getting it to fit on the specy with the limitations, blah, blah, blah. I guess the most interesting stuff is that, unusually for the time, um, Technos provided the actual game graphics to them, which they could then get onto the Amiga. Then it was a case of transferring the Amiga graphics which were mostly the sprites, to the specy and resizing plus uh, touching them up to work. And you'll notice the sprites are actually split into two for the torso and legs for performance. Uh, I should mention this level as well. If you go to the higher level here, um, instead of the lower level, you get spikes that come out the ground at you. So just stick to the lower level. Um, he also mentions in the article that animation frames had to be cut from the original eight down to four and the arcade background graphics didn't really work when transferred down to the specy, so these were all redrawn from scratch and that's about the most interesting stuff i can find about the making of the game what about the plot to this all right let's uh, tell you the plot of the game um so after returning home from a two-year training mission billy and jimmy lee come across a fortune teller named hiruku hiruko the woman tells the Lee brothers that in order to challenge the world's strongest uh, adversary, they must seek out the three Rosetta Stones that have been scattered around the world. Um, and check out the time limit here, guys. I'm not going to do it. I've done this perfectly. I've got 30 odd seconds there. Anyway, carry on with the plot. The game begins in the United States where the Lee brothers must defeat the remnants of the Black Warriors gang from the previous games before they set off to find the stones. Afterward, the heroes must travel to China, Japan, where we are now, and Italy, where each of the stones are being guarded by formidable fighters unique to each country, such as swordsmen in Japan and archers in Italy, hmm. uh, will, who will refuse to give them up without a fight. Once all three Rosetta Stones have been procured, the Libra of his journey reaches its final destination in Egypt, and we ran out of time. And I didn't make a mistake there. <laughs> Rubbish is this. Uh, so they, the final destination in Egypt, where they face all sorts of... Oh, I got flattened by the door. Yikes. Because I got spawned right in front of it. Bloody hell. <laughs> where they face all sorts of supernatural creatures as they enter Cleopatra's tomb to uncover the mystery surrounding the stones. Anyway, it turns out it's all a ruse to get to Cleopatra's treasure and the third stone is never found. And if it was, apparently, its power would change the world. Hmm... Yes, so we're traveling the world game from the US to then China, Japan, Italy, and finally Egypt. Uh, at the end, we're fighting an ancient mummy. Uh, so now we have a supernatural element introduced into the Double Dragon franchise. I don't think it was before. I think there was talk about the second game that Marion, the girlfriend, gets killed and they have to go to Tibet to resurrect her or something. I don't know if that's canon or not, but, mm. but yeah, um, so now uh, we're traveling the world. So. Uh, for the third game, uh, they're kind of like, well, we can't repeat what we did in the previous two games. What do we do next in the sequel? I know. Let, let's do a world tour. So what next? You know, well, by the law of game sequels, after the world traveling sequel, there must be a time traveling sequel followed by Double Dragon in Space, maybe. Um, well, actually, fully enough, sadly, that didn't happen. Um... The franchise in the arcades died, and instead we got a substandard Streets of Rage ripoff on the SNES as the next game, and then a 1v1 fighting game a la Street Fighter 2, and a few more things uh, to diminishing returns in the, in the series, which is a bit sad, really. And less said about Double Dragon movie, the better, too. I'm surprised it didn't do a time-travelling thing. We had it in Renegade bloody free. Ugh. Um, this boss is a bit of an arse, because there's three of them. You only really need to concentrate on one of them. But the, the problem here comes from the nunchuckers they fire. I could really get in the way. I've also actually glitched the game here by kicking them off the screen to the right here somehow. A bit like what happened in that arcade um, footage I showed earlier. Um, oh god, once you get knocked down, all three of them around you doing punches and attacks at different times, so <clears throat> it's often going to hit you. 
and we got very lucky there. Sometimes, oh god! And then it's a nightmare to get back up again. And they got flying kicks they want to use as well. Mm. Um, oh, there's a cheat mode for this game, by the way, guys. On the menu screen, uh, type the word Salvatore, spell um, S A L V A T O R E, and a sound will confirm that the cheat is activated. And I've not tested that or tried it, so I can't 100% confirm that works, but it was on the CPC Power website and they're normally reliable. Um, the back of the box talks a right load of old cobblers. Um, like it mentions things like the the one armed headbutt. What the hell is that? The one armed headbutt. Can anyone explain that? And it also describes a move called the locking head squeeze, which doesn't exist. <laughs> and it looks like the game's glitched here, but actually I've just defeated the boss. They like all join back together again and then they crumble and the mission's won. I thought I was panic I was panicking when I was doing this. Oh no, it's crushed again. Um it also the back of the box even mentions grenades and knuckle dusters, which again, they aren't in the game. And they weren't even in the arcade version. Who writes this crap? <laughs> so that's the back of the box mentioned that. And what's the little old lady have to say now? I know it. You are real strong. I have the stone. From now, you will need my help. Right, okay. Um. Actually, actually guys, yeah, what the hell is a Rosetta Stone? I bet there be some of you there that don't know what it is. So, I'm going to tell you. Uh, well, I could just read out the Wikipedia page for you, but that would give us all a headache because it's quite long and lots of stuff in it. Instead, all you need to know is that the Rosetta Stone uh, is an ancient Egyptian tablet from 196 BC, which is a decree written in three parts. Uh, the top and middle text written in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics and demotic scripts, apparently, with the bottom written in ancient Greek. Uh, when it was found by the French army in the town of Rosetta in I Egypt in 1799, it was uh, famous for being used to finally start translating and understanding hieroglyphics. Um, it was taken by us Brits in 1801 when we defeated the frogs in battle, and it was taken to the British Museum where it is still to there to this day. Uh, but there's no supernatural connection or anything mythical about it just a great find and a useful piece of history um, i guess the three sections of the stone um, has led to the three stones or parts that we have to find in the game in reality it's all in one stone just three sections of it in different text um, but the name rosetta stone has entered our culture as a meaning of a translation and has even given name to relatively famous software company and, and a line of translation and language learning software. Uh, but that's the Rosetta Stone, and um, they're taking massive liberties with it here. And uh, there's certainly nothing mythical or powerful about the stone. It was just um, famous that it allowed us to start being able to translate hieroglyphics, essentially, guys. Um, I don't know. I don't know where these muscle-bound archers come from in Italy, and why Italy is famous for archers. I, I never knew that. <laughs> um, but there we go. Uh, we've actually got an enemy sprite missing here that was in the arcade version. There was a guy on horseback in the arcade version on this level, and obviously that was just too much for the eight-bit computers to handle. And probably actually quite a few, quite a few versions of this game actually. And uh, yeah, just tedious, just trying to bunch them all up to the right there and just keep kicking them when they get up. So the combat in this is just really poor, guys. Uh, the AI of the characters on, on, isn't ex uh, especially brilliant. Yeah, they do kind of gang up on you and they're trying to move around to either side of you. Pretty basic stuff that, you know, games like Renegade on the Amstrad did years ago and better. Um... Um, I suppose what have we got? We've got the punch, the kick, the special spinning kick if you buy it in the weapon shop, which you're going to, aren't you? Um, and the wall jump move, and that's it. But he's really going to use that wall jump move. So, 
pretty limited range of moves, which is a shame. Um, let's talk then about the other versions of the game while we're here. Um, ZX Spectrum version. Of course, the CPC version is a direct port of this with little if no optimizations. In fact, as you can see, guys, it's worse. It's slower, slow as hell. Uh, on the Specky, the title screen has some very nice music, actually. Otherwise, it's identical, apart from playing a lot faster and smoother. As for that dreaded timer and clock, um, which we're struggling against here. Um, now, on the... F uh, <sighs> The CPC version runs down a heck of a lot quicker, strangely. So the main game runs slower, but the clock and timer runs faster on the Amstrad. Hmm. Now, on the first level, the timer on the Specky version starts at 169 seconds, but the CPC version has been bumped up to compensate starting at 349. So the programmer knew that um, there wasn't enough time, but still didn't play test this properly. Um, as you saw, guys, we just uh, we didn't see that we uh, we saw there was only enough time just on the first level and the second level, uh, but on the previous uh, yeah the Jap J Japan level there wasn't enough time. And look, we're on the final boss here, and we've only got twenty seconds left. And I've been absolutely perfect on this level, so play testing fail. I'm gonna lose marks for that. Anyway, back to the specy version. Um. Even the Specky version has a very tight time limit anyway too, but far, far less so than the CPC, which is just ridiculous as we can see here. We run out of time, bloody hell. Um, we don't get to play as like the extra new character like on the arcade version. This guy, this this boss has got a really long reach of his weapon. But again, it's just really so easy to move vertically into him and kick him and count to three seconds when he gets knocked down and kick at the right moment and just r rinse and repeat. Um, only other differences on the Specky version is on the very final boss battle. The Specky has a nice scrolling star field in the background, which is missing on the CPC, which is a shame. Um, it also has some new music on the ending sequence, uh, which again is also missing on the CPC, uh, which is just lazy because they're both AY chip tunes and they could have easily been loaded in. Um, and lastly, the Specky version is bizarrely 128k only, whereas the CPC version is fine with 64k. There we go. We're on the final mission here uh, in Egypt. For some reason, there's uh, guys on motorcycles here as well. <laughs> Um, Cold Off 64 version has a lovely animated title screen, just like the arcade version, a track sequence, and a really nice atmospheric tune. Um, it has really good presentation, and it includes like the world map as well. Um, graphics are a little bit more colourful, but they are incredibly, and I mean incredibly blocky. They look like they're made out of Lego. I've mentioned that before about as a complaint about some Cold Off 64 graphics, but Jesus, guys. The common the, these those sprites on Double Dragon Three and the Commodore are like so chunky and blocky. I think the the sprites have been stretched and resized or something from smaller sprites. Anyway, um, however though the animation is uh, really good on the sprites and they move very smoothly as the, as do they animate smoothly, and the scrolling's nice and smooth too. Um, the combat is as limited as the Specky uh, and CPC versions, so no real surprises here. And in part from the inclusion of the head, neck, toss move. Um, so in game, it all looks rather crude with the Commodore 64 showing its age. Um, level two is missing the conveyor belt, um, and the e Egypt mission has the missing level with the rising stones which is missing on the Specky and Amstrad versions. Um, and it also includes the annoying spinning spike disc bit in the Egypt level and from the arcade that made me rage quit the coin-up version when I was playing it uh, on a live stream a while ago. Um, Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES. Uh, not really a proper conversion. It was actually developed alongside the arcade version in parallel. And although all the uh, plot is similar, it differs a lot. Um, indeed, it was renamed from the Rosetta Stone to the Sacred Stones. Mm. Uh, Amiga version, uh, pretty much a spot on conversion by the looks of it, almost arcade perfect, just with more muted, duller colors, strangely. Um, sprite movement and scrolling seems a lot smoother than the actual coin hop. And if for some demented reason you were a big fan of the coin hop, 
uh, you'd be very, very happy with the Amiga version. And in, in, actually, in actually several ways, it's actually better than the uh, coin op. Uh, Tori SD version has the exact same music as the specy version of the title screen. It's identical. Uh, well, it does use the AY, uh, version of the AY chip. Um, but yes, otherwise, the Atari ST version is identical to the Amiga one, with just basically not as good sound effects or music, and with slightly less smoother moving sprites and scrolling. But it's, it's, that's hardly noticeable, and there's not much in it. It also came out on PC DOS, and it's not bad for an early PC game. Uh, plays and looks like the ST version, but with a lot rougher sprite movement. Probably a few frames of animation are missing on that as well, and the sound effects is not very good too. Uh, two other versions to talk about quickly, it appeared on the Sega Mega Drive, and it's the only version to try and emulate the arcade music on the title screen. Decent graphics to the Mega Drive, although not as good as the Amiga, but it is actually more colourful. Um, I actually prefer the graphics to the Amiga one because the, it, just, it just looks brighter and more colourful. And that's a really good thumping tune on level one. And it also moves a lot more smoother and fluid than the coin up 2 as well. Um, Game Boy, um, last version. Um, it dropped the Rosetta Stone name. It was just called Double Dragon 3, the arcade game. Um, it seems to play pretty similar to the other previous Double Dragon games on the Game Boy. Uh, both were decent though, and this seems it too. Um, movement and scrolling is a little jittery at times, and there's also some sprite flicker, but we're used to that on the Game Boy. Um, now usually, uh, like the NES version of this game, the Game Boy port often varies a lot from the source material, with extra levels, like the Double Dragon 1 port had, and other gameplay elements. But here it actually plays very close to the arcade original, and it's a pretty decent um, conversion actually. And the coder, uh, is our old friend Ken Murphy, who did a uh, Twin Turbo V8 on the Amstrad and often chats to me on Twitter because he later went on to work on my favourite current gen game, H1Z1. Oh, this door will never open without the Rosetta Stones. There is a secret hidden beneath. Go find out what it is, says Hiruko, the old silly old bat with the stick. There we go. Um, so there we go, guys. Coming up to the, finally getting towards the very near uh, end of the game. So open the door, step on the blocks. This level is an absolute nightmare. Um, you can't be too far up or land too slightly a pixel to the right. You've got to land exactly where I'm landing on here and the way it spells out Rosetta. R-O-S-E-T-T-A on the floor there. And if you're slightly a pixel to the left or the right or up or down, and sometimes the the point you need to land on those stones is slightly different to the next one. That is an absolute nightmare of a section there, guys. It's, obviously, I did it in one go there, so I'm doing a long play of this. So um, take a snapshot for that bit, guys. Trust me on that one. Now, these fat guys here, that looks like they're sort of fat stone men for, uh, or something. They're actually supposed to be mummies, like small, like fat mummies. And they disappear and reappear uh, like behind you. But actually, because it so slowly happens, it's really easy to actually hit them. Um, magazine review at the time, Amstraction Review. It was reviewed in issue 78 of AA in their March 1992 issue. Uh, their, ver their verdict score um, was rather odd. And I just wonder how much attention the normally likeable reviewer that was Adam Peters was paying at the time when he rated um, what little sound effects there are at 71%. There's literally two sound effects and they're not very good. And he gave sound effects 71%. <laughs> anyway, um, graphics got 82%, grab factor 81% and stain power 81% too, which gave an overall rating of, wait for it, 81% <laughs> weird not once is the uh, horrible speed and slowdown mentioned in the review not once but there you go that's the strange reviewing style of Adam Peters in Amstrad Action Magazine I did like his writing style a lot of the times but boy did he miss out some key parts um, of the game in his review Reviews didn't really seem to care that uh, back then. These days, reviews of games are so critical uh, over every little detail and go into so much depth and detail that reviews, when I read reviews online, say, of like new games and stuff, uh, it, they're just boring. 
<laughs> but at least they're fair. At least they're accurate. Anyway, so there we go. Um, hmm. Have I got anything else to mention? Um, not really. At the time of this release, um, Double Dragon Two was not long released, re-released at budget and was in the charts at the time. And it was the crap version, not the excellent Richard Aplin one. Uh, I don't know if that gave Double Dragon Three a boost in sales or a drop in sales. <laughs> Who knows? Could be. I could go either way. That. I'm impressed. You really have strength, says Haruko, the strange old lady with the stick. And like in the arcade version, she now decides to attack you. And bear in mind, guys, at this point, we've only got two of the stones. Not three of them. It's a little bit confusing in the story and the plot. But essentially, this is all a ruse um, for you to take this old lady to the treasure of Cleopatra in her tomb uh, in this pyramid, essentially. But really, who gives a chuff about the plot here? Um, but there we go. Um... What do I think to this game then overall? Um, I think the sprites actually look quite nice and the background graphics are actually done really nicely. Um, this is actually quite a very good use of mode one and I'm not too unhappy about the graphics because I always kind of prefer mode nought, lots of colors, chunky pixels and all that. But I actually don't mind the graphics here at all. It's just the speed of the game guys. It's the biggest killer of it. It's just painfully slow, painfully slow. Um, because of the limited kind of combat, the game becomes a complete slog. Oh, we just defeated her. And she runs off. My, my treasure. So we're actually after treasure here. And what you need to do is just jump into the background here. And we come with the final level. And here we go. Oh, bit of animation there, nice. Again, nice use, nice use of colours in mode one. I have to give it credit. And it's a, oh my god, it's the the mummy of Cleopatra. Okay, just getting close, moving vertically, and if you can get the uh, mummy against the back wall there, just keep spamming the kick, and it's easily defeated. <laughs> Pretty pathetic, really. And that kind of sums this game up. The limited combat as well does not help matters. Becomes a bit of an annoying, slow-paced slog. Uh, oh, there we go. The mummy is now turning into Cleopatra. Um, apparently, our, the tomb is now in space. <laughs> now, in the specy version and other versions of the game, the, the star field there, the stars are all scrolling and stuff and moving about. But sadly, they're all, it's static on the Amstrad version. <laughs> Another bit of a letdown there. Um, so overall, guys, um, with the poor limited sound effects, no music and stuff, the highest I can really rate this game. I think some people might get a bit of an enjoyment out of it. It's quite mindless kind of stuff, as is quite a lot of like scrolling beat em up games. But with the slow pace, sluggish controls, um, limited combat. There's, there's no let frames of animation here on Cleopatra apart from when she attacks and gets hit. Bless. Um, with all that said and crap sound effects, limited sound effects, no music and stuff. Highest I can give this game, guys, I think is a six out of ten. But I kind of, kind of, almost tempted to give it to five and a half. But I did have some kind of enjoyment from it, and they've tried to do the best job in getting the arcade version crammed in there. But, you know, hey, Richard Aplin managed it on Double Dragon 1 or 2. And there we go, guys. The battle has ended. We have beaten the game. We get an ending screen here. The heroes swore they would give Cleopatra's treasure to charity. When the third stone is found, its power will change the world. So there we go, guys. We weren't, we didn't need to go after the Rosetta stones, even though there's only one stone. Uh, we only found two of them. That old lady just wanted to get to Cleopatra's treasure. That's all it was. And we didn't get to the third step part of the stone. And that's it. That's your lot for Double Dragon 3. So, um, 
I would give this a percentage score of about 59%. So you choose whether you want me to give it a five and a half or six. I can't decide between the two. I'm actually kind of very into maybe five and a half. Mm. I'm always a little bit generous. Six out of ten. So there you go. That is Double Dragon free. And just quickly, guys, I'm going to show you two players simultaneously in action. And to be fair um, to the coders and stuff, um, it doesn't actually slow the game down anymore. It actually plays at the same speed and stuff, and actually works quite well. Um, but I don't think I've, I've not been able to get them to combine their attack abilities together like you can on the arcade version. So there you go, guys. All right, that's me done. Finally done with Double Dragon 3, and you can kick your uh, mate as well across the screen if you want to be evil. <laughs> nice. All right, guys, see you again soon. Goodbye. So thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed that, if you did please click a like below, leave a comment and also subscribe if you haven't already, and over that way there's another video for you to check out. Zypho, out.